welcome to this Creative Soul webinar. This time we're with Nilesh Ashar. Nilesh is a, it's a partner at, uh, is a tax partner with KPMG based in Dubai with over 25 years of experience in working for the big four international consultancy firms and M&A tax experience, advising clients across emerging markets in the Middle East and India and mature economies in the UK and Europe. Nilesh, once again, thank you so much for joining us and for taking the time to, 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 to do this webinar with us. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo, and uh, a big thank you to Creative Zone for, for inviting me to talk on this uh, very important and relevant subject uh, of, of ESR. Great, so maybe let's, let's get to it. I know that you have a little presentation to, to share with us, but uh, the topic of this, of this webinar is UAE's economic substance regulations. Uh, yes. They were introduced earlier in the year. There were quite a few things that we needed to pass on to our network and to the people uh, that own companies that, um, that they needed to learn about this, this topic. And there's some new changes, some adaptations to this regulation that just recently happened. So maybe, maybe if we could do a small summary of, of what are the economic substance regulations and the basic main pillars of the, of the recently introduced changes. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, yeah, sure, I can, I can certainly do that, Lorenzo. And I've got a, sl a small presentation which I'll, I'll run through shortly. Uh, but you're right, the, the economic substance regulations, and I think most of the audience has, has hopefully at least heard of the, the original regulations that, um, that came on and may have looked at it already in the context of their uh, business. Uh, these regulations were brought in originally last year, actually, in, uh, in April of 2019, uh, effective financial years commencing on or after 2019. And this, these regulations were largely on the back of UAE's um, commitment to the OECD and the EU. Uh, and following, uh, you know, UAE uh, getting blacklisted by the EU uh, as a as a tax haven, uh, and it, the commitment was to uh, support the international and OECD's initiative uh, on uh, on 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 companies looking to adopt a base erosion strategies for tax purposes, and supporting the international view that businesses ought to be taxed in jurisdictions where there is appropriate uh, substance. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, UA does not have a corporation tax uh, regime, but what, but what UA does want to support is the, the international community's view that any business that is carried on in the UA uh, and which carries on one of the nine geographically mobile businesses or business activities, which we'll talk about in a moment, has to be supported by a minimum level of substance uh, in the UAE uh, linked to uh, you know, how those companies are operated, um, uh, how activity is conducted, how business is conducted, how meetings are, are held, uh, and whether there are appropriate employees, assets, and uh, expenditure incurred to support the activities uh, carried out by, uh, by companies uh, in the UAE. There were a set of compliance requirements that came out as part of the original regulations. Uh, but those regulations have been uh, repealed, um, and I'll, I'll just move on to my my presentation now. Uh, and they've been replaced with a new set of uh, regulations um, on the economic substance um, of, on the economic substance rules. You know, if you can see my yeah my slide, yeah yeah. So you've got the. Um, so, so what we're going to cover, uh, and I'll, I'll come on to that, really the background which we've already started uh, talking about um, uh, as to the, the context of ESR, how it, how it works. Uh, we'll talk about what the new economic substance regulations mean, what has changed from the previous ones, and what do businesses need to do in terms of notifications that have already been filed under the, uh, under the old regulations. Uh, and really uh, then look at uh, what businesses need to do going forward, and then obviously um, open to, to Q&A. So as I said, the new UAE ESR rules, um, the original rules came out in April of 2019. But once those rules came out, there was review of those uh, UAE's rules by the OECD and the EU. And um, based on that review, 
uh, the new rules have come out. Now we, now we were aware that the original rules were not strictly aligned with the um, econ similar economic substance rules that have come out in other parts uh, of the world. You know, there are 10 odd jurisdictions that have introduced similar rules um, as, the, as the UA on economic substance. And these are largely jurisdictions that do not have a corporation tax uh, regime or have a very low level of corporation tax, you know, the likes of Cayman Islands, BVI, uh, Jersey, Guernsey, Mauritius, uh, the Seychelles, et cetera. Uh, so, the, the, so UA's regulations were not really aligned with those other countries' regulations and what was the OECD's standard on, on substantial activities uh, requirement. Uh, and, and based on that feedback, um, uh, the new law has come out. And one of the big differences, which we'll talk about in a moment, is around the expanded list of exemptions uh, that have been introduced uh, in the new law. Uh, particularly in the context of, uh, of branches of, of foreign companies. Uh, but importantly, the government entity exemption, which was previously available under the old law, has, has gone away. But again, we'll, we'll come on to that in a, in a moment. The, uh, the new ESR law, again, repeals and replaces the old law. And you can see a whole set of original regulations at the bottom of the screen that were repealed uh, and replaced by the new ESR law, which is really cabinet uh, resolution number 57 of 2020, along with ministerial decision number 100 uh, of 2020 and, and the revised uh, regulations and FAQs uh, along with that. So you now have a new set of law, but the law applies with retroactive Im uh, implication from 1st of January, 2019. And this is really important because it does mean some of the actions that businesses may have taken do need to be revisited in the context of the new law. Uh, going forward, uh, while we don't expect the law to again change substantially, uh, but we certainly, do, we certainly do expect there to be additional guidance uh, and clarifications that will come out in the context of the new law, which, uh, which businesses ought to monitor and, uh, and, and track and, and assess the impact of, of any clarification that may come out uh, in the future. In, in summary, the way ESR works, you still need to look at whether you are a, a licensee in the, uh, in the UE, and there is definite changes to the definition of licensee, which we'll come on to in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, if you're not a licensee, um, you know, carrying out one of those nine uh, relevant activities for ESR, uh, which hasn't changed under the new law, then the, 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 the rules do not apply. So if you are not a licensee or you are not carrying on one of the nine relevant activities, um, then the ESR rules do not apply. If you are a licensee uh, that's carrying on one of the relevant activities, so you may be a, um, a, a, a UAE branch of a foreign company that carries on a banking business, um, you may be entitled to an exemption uh, if you satisfy certain conditions, but even if you are entitled to the exemption, you still need to make a notification claiming the exemption from the rules. Uh, and where you earn income from a relevant activity, uh, assuming you're not entitled to the exemption, then you are required to satisfy the economic substance tests, uh, which are the three minimum tests around having around demonstrating that your core income generating activity is carried on in the UA, the entity, the UA entity is directed and managed in the UA, and that there are adequate number of uh, employees. Uh, operating expenses and physical assets or premises in the UA through which the activity is, is carried on. Uh, again, adequacy is not, is not defined, so there is an element of subjectivity in how you interpret those uh, and apply those rules. Uh, and then uh, there are uh, you know, additional compliances relating to uh, an ESR report that needs to be filed at the, end of, uh, at the end of the year, within 12 months of the end of the financial year. Uh, there is... Uh, and, and the report gets filed on the uh, Ministry of Finance portal, which is yet to be launched. Uh, and then you'll get the regulators, uh, the regulatory authority, which is the relevant free zone authority or the Ministry of Economy for, for mainland that will perform the basic checks on the notification and the, and the return that has been filed, uh, followed by uh, the new introduction of the Federal Tax Authority as an assessing authority as the national assessing authority that will perform the audits and assessments of the economic substance reports, whereas previously this was this responsibility was delegated to the regulatory authority. 
to the extent the federal tax authority determines that you do not satisfy the substance uh, tests or that you have failed the tests, uh, then they will uh, levy penalties uh, that are prescribed under the regulations. And we'll talk about those in a bit more detail. But importantly, the information about uh, the fact that an entity has failed the test will then be passed on to, uh, uh, to tax authorities and jurisdictions where the ultimate parent entity, the parent entity, and the ultimate beneficial owner is, um, is located. So there is an exchange of information that will happen between the Ministry of Finance and tax authorities of other countries if, uh, if you fail the economic substance tests. You in terms just, of just to come in, I'm sure you're going to cover this at some point, Nilesh, but you were saying, uh, how does it apply for those that have already submitted uh, their the economic substance reports and did the tests? Um, do they, you, you said that the that, that, that new changes uh, work retroactively. Yes. So I, I would not have expected anyone to have filed the reports, uh, but certainly notifications would have been filed. Uh, and I will cover it in more detail, but very quickly to answer you, uh, answer your question, Lorenzo, the notifications have to be refiled uh, on the Ministry of Finance portal and refiled based on the new rules um, and based on certain additional information that we think uh, will likely be asked uh, on, the, um, on, on the new portal. I'll come on to that uh, in Excellent. a moment, but yes, there is a requirement to refile under the new law. Excellent. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of timeline, as I said, for for financial year ending 31st of December 2019, the um, the renotification needs to be filed uh, as soon as the Ministry of uh, Finance portal goes live, which we think will be in Q4. So anytime now, um, you know, going up to perhaps uh, November, late November is when we expect. We think the portal will go live, so that needs to be filed then. And then by the end of December, there is the report that needs to go in. Uh, and the Federal Tax Authority has up to six years uh, to perform an audit. Uh, so it's important that any report that's filed and any supporting documents in relation to the reports are maintained for a period of six years uh, to submit to the authorities if asked. Uh, failure to do that will attract um, penalties uh, ranging between 50,000 and 400,000 uh, dirhams. Uh, again, we'll talk about that um, in, a, in a bit more detail. Just wanted to cover in summary how, how the new rules will uh, new rules will work. There's a lot of detail to walk through, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, thought, you know, this slide should give uh, the audience hopefully a quick summary of, uh, of how you navigate your way through these, uh, through the rules. So some of the highlights of the new economic substance regulations is that there is a new definition of of a licensee or an exempted licensee that is in scope. Uh, I think the important one there is that while previously 51% government owned entities uh, were exempt under the original rules, uh, they are now no longer exempt. Uh, and, and while branches of foreign companies were in scope, uh, they're still in scope unless they are branches of foreign companies where the income is taxed uh, back, in, um, back in the home country. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. There are definitions to uh, definition changes um, relating to connected person group, uh, which has an impact on the classification or the definition of some of the relevant activities, uh, which will have an impact on how these activities may have been classified under the original notifications that were filed. Uh, some clarification on the treatment of branches, both UAE and, and foreign branches. Uh, Federal Tax Authority has been introduced as um, uh, the national assessing authority that will be responsible for the audits and assessments um, and there is dilution of the role of the free zone authorities and the ministry of economy the central bank uh, uh, and etc as i said there will be a new portal that will be launched by the ministry of finance where all notifications and reports will be filed or need to be filed and importantly the previously filed notifications as i mentioned do need to be refiled on this um, on this portal uh, thankfully, uh, and importantly, there are no changes to the economic substance tests by themselves. So those remain the same and, and I'll briefly touch upon those tests in uh, what those tests are in, uh, in, in my presentation. So just very quickly to recap, what are those relevant activities? As I said, you are in scope of the regulations. Um, only if, if you see the box on the, on the left of the screen, if you're in scope of the regulations, only if you carry on one of these nine uh, relevant activities. Um, and what these are really is uh, 
there's, there's distribution and service centers, holding companies, IP business, lease finance business, headquarter businesses. Um, and uh, then there is uh, you know, shipping, and then you have the whole range of financial services, which is banking, insurance, and investment management. Uh, there is no change to the definition per se. Uh, there are certain changes to the definitions of groups uh, and connected person, which does bring in certain definition to certain changes in the definition. But I think the important one to talk about is on, on distribution and service business, which I think we apply to many uh, of uh, many of your clients, um, uh, Lorenzo, and, and many on this uh, on this webinar, is that under the old regulation, there was some confusion. Uh, the old regulation uh, provided the context of distribution businesses. The old regulation said that a, a company is considered engaging in a distribution business if it purchased goods from a foreign connected person, imported and stored those goods in the UAE, and then resold those goods outside the UAE. Uh, and this was not in line with the uh, definition on distribution businesses in, in other countries and was not in line with the spirit of the economic substance regulations. And our view all along was that even if there was no physical import of goods uh, in the UAE, so, so drop shipment models, trans shipment models, where just the trading invoices are, are issued and raised by the businesses or entities in the UAE, but the goods move directly from origination to destination outside of the UAE. Uh, those are now in scope, uh, but provided those goods are purchased from a foreign connected person. And in the context of services, uh, previously you had to render services to a foreign connected person in connection with their business outside the UAE. That requirement has, has, uh, has gone away. Uh, so any services provided to a foreign connected person is now in, in scope. Holding company business is where you have the sole function of uh, acquiring and, and holding shares and earning dividends and capital gains only. Um, helpfully um, and in line with the original regulations, holding company businesses have reduced substance requirements um, that are helpful. And then you've got you know, IP business, where any IP is exploited, lease finance, where there are any intercompany loans um, given for, uh, or credit given for consideration. Uh, those are in, uh, in scope. Headquarter businesses, where there are you know, group activities coordinated from the UAE senior management responsible for looking at uh, the regional activities uh, of, the, of the group. Um, and any group activities are coordinated like finance, HR, legal, and you have many businesses in the UAE that perform a headquarter function. Those are uh, in scope as a relevant uh, activity. Uh, shipping uh, business. So have, have, sorry to, to interrupt, sure. have any of the activities changed in the new? Yes, in the new so there are changes. Yes, there are changes to distribution and service business, which I just talked through. Um, certain definition changes to the holding company business. Um, I'll, I'll explain it through an example coming through in the, uh, in the, in the new law, but yes, there are def changes to distribution service center, holding business, IP businesses, uh, in particular, but no change in lease finance business, um, or, uh, or headquarter business, uh, or in fact, uh, any other, uh, you know, businesses like banking, shipping, insurance, uh, investment fund management business is uh, is no change uh, no change in those uh, business activities either. Um, as I said, there are certain changes to the exemption category. So where you have branches of foreign companies that engage in one of these activities, uh, while they perform a relevant activity, they would uh, potentially be entitled to an exemption now under the new rules, which they were not previously entitled to under the under the original regulations. Uh, again, I'll, I'll come on to what these changes are uh, in specifically in the context of distribution and uh, and holding company. Uh, but very brief, very quickly, the three tests that need to be met if you are in scope of the regulations, if you carry on a relevant activity, one of the nine relevant activities, and if you earn income from those activities, then you have to meet all of the tests uh, that you can see. And the tests are essentially linked to how is your entity managed and, and directed um, in the UA? So demonstration of actual board meetings taking place in the UA, the directors physically attending those board meetings, 
the meeting should have deliberation of the discussions that have taken place. The, the minutes should have deliberation of the discussions taking place at the meeting. Uh, you know, the director should have appropriate qualification to act as uh, as directors and so on and so forth. There's a prescriptive list of criteria that needs to be uh, to be met. The second test is around demonstrating that the core income generating activity in relation to the relevant activity uh, is actually undertaken in the uh, in the UA. So if you are carrying on a, a lease finance business or a holding business, then the actual activities that relate to performing the holding function or the lease finance function which is for example the activity of negotiating loan terms or negotiating the interest rates etc should all be undertaken by the employees in the ua because these are the core activities that generate the income from a relevant activity and those core activities need to be performed in the uh, in the ua there is some guidance in the uh, in the regulations which was there in the original regulations as well that hasn't changed um, but there is, uh, but these uh, activities are not prescriptive. Uh, you need to be able to demonstrate what are those core income generating activities in the context of uh, your own business that needs to be demonstrated and, and documented. And the third test is around the adequacy test. So you need to prove that you've got adequate um, uh, qualified uh, full-time employees, adequate expenditure and adequate physical presence in the UA. Uh, and again, uh, what is adequate is not defined and the regulations uh, acknowledge that uh, you cannot have a prescriptive rule around adequacy uh, because adequacy can change from one business to another and can change from one year to another uh, and therefore it's more a self-assessment that businesses need to do to um, assess and then therefore and then demonstrate to the FTA that its uh, employees expenditure and, and physical premises or physical assets are adequate for conducting the business uh, activity. Right now, so getting into the uh, the new um, uh, regulations and some of the changes, um, the the most important change is in the definition of both licensee and an exempted licensee. So previously, under the old regulations, even a natural person could be considered as a licensee so long as it uh, as he or she carried on a relevant activity. You, under the new regulations, a licensee can only be either a juridical person, a corporate uh, entity that has a separate legal personality, or an unincorporated partnership which doesn't have separate legal personality, uh, but that carries on a relevant activity. Importantly, as per the FAQs to the regulations, a natural person, a sole proprietorship, trust and foundations are not considered licensees. So natural physical uh, persons, sole proprietorships, and there are a number of sole proprietor uh, uh, arrangements or uh, entities or licenses that are there, essentially that have unlimited liability and the liability flows back to the, to the sole proprietor. Those are outside the scope of the regulations, including of course trust and, and foundations. And there are a number of trust and foundation structures in, uh, in some of the free zones. Uh, those are outside the scope of, um, of the regulation. Uh, you then have exempted license category. So you need to first be a licensee, which means if you're a corporate entity uh, or an unincorporated entity like a partnership, but you carry on a relevant activity, you're a licensee, but then you could get out of the definition if you're an exempted licensee. Now, under the old regulations, uh, entities um, with a 51% direct or indirect government ownership were regarded as an exempted licensee. However, under the new regulations, um, and in line with um, the regulations in the other countries, you've got an expanded list of, of exemptions. Uh, investment funds uh, and SPVs owned by investment funds are exempt. UA branches of foreign companies where the relevant income is subject to tax in the parent company jurisdiction. And this does create some, um, some uncertainty and, and confusion. We'll try and, uh, we'll try and decode or demystify this, uh, what this really means with some examples. But essentially, UA branches of foreign companies where the branch income is subject to tax in the foreign parent jurisdiction is entitled to the exemption. Uh, licensees that are tax resident outside the UA. So if you have a UA entity that is effectively managed and controlled from outside the UA and therefore regards its tax residency to be outside the UA is again entitled to the exemption. 
pure domestic businesses that are not part of a multinational group uh, and carry on their activities only in the UAE are, are exempt again. And then there's a last category which says any licensee that the Minister of Finance regards or grants an exemption to. So that's more a carte blanche um, authority given to the Ministry of Finance to, um, to, to issue additional exemptions uh, under, the, under the regulations. The important bit to note that if you are claiming an exemption under the new ESR rules, um, it's not as straightforward. You do need to still file an exemption. Uh, you still need to file the notification claiming the exemption. Um, and along with the notification, you need to attach supporting documents for claiming the, uh, the exemption. So if you are claiming that you're exempt under the category that you're a foreign tax resident entity, then the tax residency certificate of the company needs to be submitted. If you're a branch of a foreign company, then perhaps a copy of the corporate tax return of the foreign parent in the home jurisdiction uh, where the income of the branch is included needs to be, needs to be uh, attached. The important bit of being an exempted licensee is that you submit the notification, claim the exemption, and that's it. Um, you're not required to meet the ESR tests and, and submit an ESR report, but you should be aware that the moment you claim the exemption, uh, and if you do satisfy and, and, and if that exemption is confirmed, the Ministry of Finance will exchange your information uh, about the fact that you have claimed the exemption with the foreign tax authorities, where you are either claiming that you are a tax resident in the jurisdiction that you're claiming to be a tax resident in, or if you're a UA branch of a foreign company, then in the tax jurisdiction of the foreign parent, the Ministry of Finance will exchange your information that you've claimed this exemption with the tax authority of that other country so that the other country's tax authority can properly assess that there is no, that, you know, that income has been taxed in, in one of the other jurisdictions and you're not effectively setting up in the UA purely to claim uh, that the profits that you earn from UAE has escaped uh, taxation altogether because the income would be taxed in the foreign uh, parent company's uh, jurisdiction or the foreign head so, office. Nilesh, so, so for all companies that are exempt and, and even out of the scope, they all need to file for a notification. So as I said, so short answer is, so you need to, the, the, you need to first determine whether you're a licensee. So if you're a licensee and you can be a licensee under the new regulations, if you carry on a relevant activity. So mm -hmm. if you do not carry on a relevant activity at all, doesn't matter whether you're entitled to the exemption or not, you don't need to file. Okay. So it's only if you carry on a relevant activity that you have an obligation to file. Mm -hmm. And you either file saying you carry on a relevant activity and whether you have income and whether you will meet the test or you file saying we do carry on a relevant activity, but we are exempted uh, under one of the exemptions that, that I've just talked through. Right. So if, if you do totally, not carry if you're out- totally out of scope, you don't need to file for a notification. Correct. So if you just go back to my, my flow chart, if you look at the first box on the left, yeah. If you are not a licensee, which means you are not a company, a uh, corporate entity or an unincorporated partnership or, and, that, and that you do not carry on a relevant activity, mm. you, you, ESR does not apply. The yeah. answer is no, nothing needs to be done. Yeah. So that's the, that's the first step that needs to be taken into account. Now, one question that I'm thinking a lot of people might be asking themselves, how and where do they file for these notifications? It needs to be, uh, the notification needs to be filed on the Ministry of Finance portal, hmm. which is yet to be launched. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we expect the portal to go live um, sometime in November or early December. Mm -hmm. uh, and once that portal goes live, and, and we all need to await the details of what information needs to go in in this new notification requirement, right. all the previously filed notifications have to be refiled. Right. Okay. To That's all the attendees there, we're getting a lot of really good questions. I'm holding some of the questions for maybe another 10, 15 minutes from now so that we let Nilesh go through the slides. And yeah. then we do a bit of a strong Q&A session towards the middle end of, of, of the webinar. Right, Nilesh? Yeah. Sure. I'll try, and, I'll try and wrap up in 10 minutes so that we, yeah. we have another 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, we so have plenty. We have plenty of time. Okay, okay, no problem. 
So just, just looking into the exemption in a bit more detail, because I think this is really important in the context of the new regulations, starting from the left. If you are in an investment fund, an investment fund is uh, an, an entity that's registered as an investment fund and that has as its um, objective, you know, pooling investor funds with a view to generating profits. If you're an investor fund, then even if you have an SPV, which would up in the in the UAE, which would otherwise be a holding company, both the investment fund and the SPV is exempt. However, the portfolio company into which the investment fund exempt uh, makes the investment is not by itself entitled to the exemption. If the portfolio company carries on a relevant activity, it is in scope of the regulations. Then you look at a UA entity. The second exemption is that of a UA entity. Let's say that claims that its central management and control is in the UK and that the income of the UA company is fully taxed in the UK as a UK corporate tax payer by virtue of management and control. So even though you're a UA company, but effectively managed and controlled entirely from the UK as a result of which the UA company becomes a UK tax resident, uh, then the UA company can claim uh, and file for an exemption. The third category is of a pure UA business. So in this example, you've got a, a UA business, uh, company A and company B, uh, owned entirely by a UA resident, which is uh, defined to include a UA national or a foreign national uh, like you and me, Lorenzo, that may that have a UA residency visa. Uh, in this case, both company A and company B, if they conduct a relevant activity, they are exempt because they are a pure domestic business. Uh, they're carrying on their activities in the UAE and they're owned by a UAE national. However, the moment the uh, group has an entity, let's say in Saudi Arabia, uh, and that Saudi Arabian entity is consolidated into company A and company B for financial reporting purposes and financial statement purposes, it now becomes part of a multinational enterprise group uh, and therefore falls outside the scope of the exemption. So you do need to look at the, the structure, the group structure, to determine whether or not you, can, uh, you will be entitled to exemption under this category. The next is clarification on branches, and this is again fairly, fairly helpful. Um, in the context of UA branches of UA company, starting from left, going on to the right. UA branch of UA company. I think previously there was confusion as to whether branches and parent companies need to file separate notification or can they all file one notification. You had a situation where multiple branches were filing multiple notification with the authorities. They've now clarified that if there are UA branches, whether mainland or free zone of a UA company, then a single notification report needs to be filed by the parent company, which is a helpful clarification. You then have a situation where you have a foreign branch of a UA company. So in our example, the first set of that is that you've got a UA company that has a branch in Saudi Arabia. If the branch in Saudi Arabia is taxed, subject to tax in Saudi Arabia, which it would be, uh, because Saudi Arabia has a, a branch tax of 20% on, on its activities, then the branch's activities are not included in the UA company when the UA company makes its notification and report. However, if the branch is, let's say in Bahrain, which does not apply a corporation tax, uh, in that case, the branch's activities do need to be included in the, in the UA company's activities for reporting purposes in, uh, under the ESR rules. So this is an important clarification. Uh, and again, this, this part was not clear under the original uh, record, the old regulations. Then you have UAE branches of foreign companies. And as I said, you know, in this case, you need to look at whether the income of the UAE branch is reported or subject to tax in the hands of the parent. In this case, the first example is a UAE branch of an Irish company and the branch profits are taxed in the hands of the Irish parent. Um, this will be exempt from ESR. The UAE branch will be exempt from ESR. Whereas in the second case where you've got a UA branch of a, um, let's say a Bahraini company, uh, then because Bahrain does not apply a corporation tax, the UA income will not be taxed in, um, in, in Bahrain or it could be Cayman Islands or, or BVI. And therefore this is not likely to qualify for uh, exemption under the rules. 
some of the amended definition i think the 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 first one is on on holding company i think the key change is that previously there the, the position was unclear whether if you had a minority holding let's say 14% as you can see in the in the in the example uh, are you regarded as carrying on a holding company business because under the old rules uh, you you had to be a holding company first in accordance with the law applicable to the licensee carrying on the activity and under the ua commercial companies law a holding company was one that had uh, uh, had a subsidiary or investment or control of a subsidiary and had majority shareholding majority voting rights and otherwise majority control over the subsidiary so minority entities were arguably outside the scope of the regulations but that definition has been withdrawn and replaced with the primary uh, with the definition which says that the sole function should be acquisition and holding of shares and the earning of of dividend uh dividend or, or gains and therefore minority shareholding companies will now bring abc co in, in 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 this example within the scope of holding company business whereas previously it was arguably outside scope the next one as i said is on uh, the definition of connected person i won't go into the details but essentially what uh, the, the the change is, is that there is previously a connected person was included a natural person so if you were providing services to an individual shareholder let's say a majority shareholder uh, those services to that individual shareholder were, con were were regarded as services to a foreign connected person uh, however under the new esr rules the reference to an individual has been withdrawn and has been replaced by um, an entity that's part of the same group uh, and group has been defined now and there was no previous definition of group group has been defined now to mean two or more entities that that are required to prepare consolidated financial statements so the implication of that as you can as you can see is that if you have a ua company that uh, provides services to a saudi uh, sub to two saudi entities one is uh, consolidated in the financial statements and the other is an investment entity that's not consolidated um, under the previous uh, rules, both companies would have been um, uh, services to both the companies were to be regarded as a service center business. But now it's only the services rendered to the Saudi subsidiary that's consolidated, the one on the left, uh, will be regarded as a service center business and not the other, because the investment entity in Saudi is not is not consolidated and is not part of the same group. And therefore, is not a a connected person under the under the regulations. Uh, the next one is on on distribution uh, business. As I said, the, uh, I briefly touched on this. The key change is that the requirement to import and store goods purchased from a foreign connected person is now no longer there. So you know, third party shipment, trans shipment models, drop shipment models, where goods do not physically uh, touch the UAE shores. And they are, are 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 shipped directly from the procurement or the factory to the customer outside the UAE. But the invoicing takes place through the UAE. These businesses will now certainly and most definitively be in scope. Uh, our view all along was that uh, at KPMG, our view all along was that these businesses were always in scope. But this has now been expressly uh, clarified. The other change is that previously under the old rules, there was a requirement to resell the goods purchased from a foreign connected person, but the selling of the goods had to be outside the UAE. That has changed. So now even domestic sales of goods purchased from related parties or foreign connected parties will now be in, in scope of, uh, of the regulations. Again, service center business, the key change is the provision of services in connection with the business outside the UAE the reference to in connection with the business outside the UAE has been withdrawn in the definition. So what that means is that as long as a company in the UAE provides services to a foreign connected person, regardless of whether those services were in relation to the foreign connected person's UAE business or outside UAE business is now in scope of, um, of the regulations. So in this example, if you see if services are provided to um, to ABC Co in, in France by, by UAE company to market ABC Co's products in the UAE. Previously, these services were outside the scope because they were in relation to ABC Co's business uh, in, in the UAE. Uh, but now that reference to where the business is conducted uh, has, been, has been deleted. 
some of the other administration matters, uh, you know, the, the key change here, which I want to bring to everybody's attention is the, the, it's the blue box, uh, the third blue box, which is the introduction of the National Assessing Authority, the FTA, as a, as a regulator uh, or as a National Assessing Authority. So what's happened is previously you had the responsibility was given to the regulatory authority, which is a pre zone authority, the Ministry of Economy, the Central Bank, to accept the reports uh, and the notifications and also perform the audits on ESR. Uh, but now their role has been diluted to merely collecting the notifications on the report, performing basic checks to ensure accuracy of the notification and the information in the reports. Once the basic checks are done, the file needs to be passed to the National Assessing Authority, which is the FTA, and they are the ones that will conduct the audits and the assessments and the penalties. Uh, so we do expect there to be a robust um, verification of the substance tests by the, by the FTA which in my view is the right authority that should be involved in doing the, the substance testing and the so, assessment. So, but do the notifications and the tests still need to be presented to the authority or they can only need to be sent directly to the FTA? So it's, as I said, Lorenzo, there's going to be one portal uh, launched by the Ministry of Finance. We expect, and we have not seen the, the features of the portal, we expect that the regulatory authority, the national assessing authority, and the Ministry of Finance will all have simultaneous access to the portal, uh, along with the licensee or the user. We expect, suspect there may be a you know, user ID login details that will be given to each licensee. So once the licensee uploads the notification and the report on the portal, the first step will be, action will be for the regulatory authority to check the accuracy of information in the returns and the notification and then internally mark the file as ready for audit to the National Assessing Authority that will then access the file from the same portal. So there's only one filing to be done with one at, on, on one uh, online portal. And from there on at the back end, we would expect the regulatory authority, the FT and the MOF to extract the information uh, and, and liaise with the, with the licensees either through the portal uh, or based on the contact details that you would have given in the notification and the report form. The, the precise mechanics are yet to be, uh, yet to be, uh, uh, yet to be revealed. Um, uh, and, and, and we expect that to get clarified in the next, uh, in the next month or so. Great. Um, some of the other compliances are that uh, we just talked about the portal that will be launched. Uh, all the notifications for FI19 that have been filed do need to be refiled uh, once the portal goes live. And then going forward, they have clarified that notifications need to be filed within six months of the financial year end, and the actual returns have to be filed within 12 months of the end of the financial uh, end of the financial year. The other change is that we now know that so previously under the old rules, you had to give details of uh, parent company, ultimate parent company, and an uh, ultimate beneficial owner. You had to give the name, details, jurisdiction, etc. Only if you were carrying on a high risk IP business. But that has now been replaced to say that these details now need to be given for all licensees uh, and not only those licensees that carry on a high risk IP business. Uh, and in that context, you we, we also have. Uh, the cabinet uh, decision number 58 of 2020, which has introduced new requirements on all UAE companies, whether in mainland or in free zone, to maintain a register of uh, shareholders, to maintain a register of beneficial owners, and to file that with the registrar, which is likely to be the, the local authority of the, um, of the mainland and the, and the free zone authority. Uh, and it is expected that the information that's shared in the beneficial ownership register should match with the, uh, the information that you would have to file in the notification for ESR purposes, because it's all going to be centrally uh, collated and pulled together by the, by the authority. So it's extremely important that one also looks at these new regulations uh, in cabinet decision number 58 that requires you to maintain these register of beneficial owners and, and parent company details. Does, does this, would this change in any way the way that companies are being structured, this new regulation of having to submit uh, the UBOs and, and, and register them with the authority? I think it's more, uh, Lorenzo, it's more a disclosure requirement at the moment, but you know, 
I think what they're trying to get to through both the ESR and the new ministerial decision number 58 on the, on the requirement for registers to be maintained is just to have more transparency and disclosure by the groups and by businesses as to who is the shareholder, who's the beneficial owner, who's really setting up the entity, who's behind the businesses that are set up um, so that these can be tracked. Uh, and if there is any uh, you know, failure to adhere to either the ESR rules um, or the uh, banking rules, then uh, details of the beneficial owners, owners are easily available to the authorities. Today, there is no one register or there is no one file that has details or not all authorities are consistently asking for information on UBO and parent company. The financial free zones do it, ADGM and, I, and DIFC do have a requirement, uh, but other free zones do not. And, and this will only bring a level playing field uh, mm -hmm. and more transparency and more uh, KYCs to be, uh, to be done uh, mm -hmm. with an ultimate view that there is, uh, the authorities need to have full visibility on who's really behind the entities that are being set up in the, in the UAE. So for all of those that have companies registered, do we need to go back and submit this new form, let's say, that reflect the UBOs? Uh, yes, yeah, so the first deadline, uh, so the, this information needs to be submitted either at the time of incorporation of the entity or for existing companies, the first due date for maintaining and submitting this file uh, is the 27th of October, uh, which is within 60 days of the rules coming out. Uh, the first filing has to be done by the 27th of October. Uh, and uh, thereafter, if there's any change in the details of the UBO, change in the parent, uh, you know, changes in the details of the shareholders, then within 15 days of the change, the uh, information has to be updated in the in the in the file and uh, submitted to the registrar. Right. So okay. there is an ongoing monitoring that needs to be done along these uh, along these routes. And and as I said, as part of the ESR notification, where this information needs to be shared. Ideally, the information should tie in with the register that's being maintained by the company. Mm. Uh, and there should not be a discrepancy of there, or if there is a discrepancy, then that discrepancy ought to be explained uh, yeah. in some way. Uh, the other bit which was not there, the other information which we know was not there in the old regulations is the requirement to include financial statements along with the economic substance report, uh, which was previously not there. And we know that many companies in a number of free zones do not actually have financial statements. Uh, we don't know yet whether this requirement for financial statements is to audited financial statements or to management prepared financial statements. That's unclear at the moment, but certainly there is a requirement to, to submit financial statements along with the, the, the report. Mm. Uh, and the last bit is on companies in liquidation. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but they need to continue to meet the economic substance test, even though they are uh, uh, undergoing the liquidation process. Mm. Just very quickly, penalties, I think the key change in the, between the old and the new regulation is that the element of subjectivity, which was there on the scale of penalties between 10 and 50,000 dirhams and 50,000 to 300,000 dirhams in the second year has been replaced by a, a flat penalty of 50,000 dirhams for the first year, 400,000 dirhams for the uh, second year um, and these penalties can be levied up to uh, six years for um, uh, from the end of the year um, except for failure to provide uh, information uh, which is 12 months from the end of the uh, end of the period where the authority discovers the omission so we do need to ensure businesses do need to ensure that they are uh, maintaining documentation and are prepared to defend an economic substance report that's been filed for a particular year, for a period of six years. So the returns that will be filed on 31st of December 2020 uh, 20, for 2019, the files need to be maintained uh, and information needs to be maintained at least until December 31st, 2025. Yeah. Uh, because at, it's, at any point in this time scale, uh, information could be asked to support the filings made in, uh, in the context of 2019. This is my last slide, uh, Lorenzo. So really, you know, given the new rules, uh, what is it that businesses need to uh, do? In our, in our view, there are three broad steps. The first is to, for those businesses that have already filed notifications previously, 
go back and revisit the relevant activity classifications that you would have filed under the old rules. It's not just a case of simply refiling what you did previously. If you have ticked uh, a distribution and service center business or not ticked a uh, distribution and service center business, or if you, if you um, have claimed, uh, you know, if you've uh, ticked a holding company or an IP business, or you were previously a branch that submitted a notification, but you now think you're entitled to an exemption, do revisit the classifications, relevant activity classifications, see whether you're now entitled to the exemption under the new rules, and be prepared to refile the, the notifications. Okay. The the second the second action is if you are in scope and are likely to file a report is you know I think businesses have already started um, evaluating whether they meet the substance tests uh, are there any gaps what's the documentation that we need to collate and maintain uh, in the event of a challenge or an audit or to submit along with the return uh, and because we will need to give details of income and expenses for relevant activity. Uh, if you have a business that carries on multiple activities, some of which are relevant activities, you do need to call out the information in relation to income and expenses pertaining to the relevant activity from the overall financial statements. And, and obviously direct expenses are easier, but indirect expenses may have to be allocated under some transfer pricing um, methodology or, or, or other appropriate basis uh, to show what are the right expenses in relation to a relevant uh, activity. And then the last action is, is obviously be prepared to refile uh, the notifications for, for FI19 uh, and file the economic substance report on the Ministry of Finance portal uh, once the format and the details of the portal are announced, which we expect uh, to happen anytime now, but, but certainly you know, in, in a month or so at least. So that's really, uh, Lorenzo is conscious of time and conscious there may be questions, um, is, is what I wanted to cover. There's a fair bit in the legislation or the in the regulations, uh, but obviously I've tried to cover as much as I possibly could, but, but happy to take any questions now, uh, Lorenzo. Over to you. Excellent. Uh, well, Niles, thank you so much. That's, uh, that's a really well presented uh, scenario of the changes and uh, the economic substance regulations. We do uh, have a lot of questions that are coming in and to all the attendees, there's about 90 people connected. This is the time to put up your questions. So put them now in your Q&A. I have quite a few good questions already there. So I'm gonna start reading uh, some of these. Let's dedicate 10, 15 minutes to this Ninesh and we try to answer as much as possible. In the meantime, I would also like to say that as, as many of you know, at Creative Zone, we have an entire company called Creative Zone Tax and Accounting that we're able to help you submit your reports, create the tests, submit the notifications. So all of the attendees, we will be sending a copy of this presentation and also uh, a document that outlines the changes and how we can help you. If you need our help in submitting notifications, doing the tests and so on, we are here to help and, 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 and support uh, uh, with this. Uh, let me see, uh, there's a, a couple of good questions that are coming out. So for example, one Nilesh says, I coordinate communication in behalf of a, of a US company, perhaps under relevant activities is categorized as business center, yet I am a sole proprietorship. Am I considered a non-licensee or exempted licensee? Thanks. So, uh, sorry, Lawrence, did you say that the entity in the UAE is a sole proprietor entity? Yeah, he's a sole proprietorship uh, and it falls on the business center, but he's representing uh, a US company. So the question would be, is this a, a branch of the US company? I'm guessing this would be the first thing to look at, right? Yeah, I think, we, I think it's, a, it's a slightly specific fact pattern. I think we need to see what's the legal status of the, of the entity in the UA. He may be a sole manager of that entity, mm -hmm. but if it's a, if the entity is registered as a branch um, managed by the branch manager, by the individual, mm -hmm. uh, it's still likely to be a branch of the US company. Right. Um, but before that, the first thing to see is when you say business center, are the services being rendered to the US company or to a, or to a connected person, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the same group? And right. if the answer to that is yes, only then we need to look at whether we are entitled to the, to the exemption. Right. So it's difficult to give a specific answer because we need to look at and understand a bit more of the, of the structure. Yeah, Vivian, uh, we're happy. Please connect with us. 
separately to this and we'll try to answer those questions. We need to look at the, the particularities of, of this case. Talal is asking the company which has Fujeda Media City license uh, with single owner provides consultancy to foreign companies based outside of the UAE. Uh, will this need to file for ESR? When you say for provide services to foreign companies, I presume yeah. it's foreign unrelated companies. If it's yeah, to foreign yes, unrelated clients, companies. Clients outside of the UAE. But if they are clients outside of the UAE are not foreign connected persons, part of the same group. If no, they're no. third parties altogether, then you're outside the scope. Should be outside okay. the scope. Excellent. Uh, let me see. Which companies are exempt from being a licensee? Please provide examples. So as I said in my, in my presentation, there are four categories. There are investment funds and holding companies owned by, SPV is owned by investment funds. Companies in the UAE that are effectively managed and controlled uh, in a jurisdiction outside the UAE uh, and, and, and where all, it pays all of its uh, corporation tax in that jurisdiction. Uh, that's the second category. Third is branches of foreign companies where the income of the branch, UAE branch of a foreign company where the income of the UAE branch is subject to tax in the jurisdiction of the, of the foreign parent. Uh, and the fourth is if you have a, uh, a UAE company owned by a UAE resident that purely carries on domestic UAE business and there are no other entities outside the UAE, group entities outside the UAE, and it's pure UA domestic business, then that is also exempt. Excellent. And um, then, of course, if you don't undertake a relevant activity at all, then you are not right. in scope of the regulations. Um, another good question here. It says, in the event that UBO is a resident of UAE, or I'm guessing also maybe the question could, could be if it's a citizen of the UAE, in the case of the local sponsors, with whom will the UAE exchange the information? This is a valid point. In the case that you have a majority shareholder and you present this UBO, suddenly is the manager still, let's say in the license, able to be the, the first point of contact in, 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 in within the authority? No, so there are two things here, Lorenzo. One is who is the designated uh, contact person to whom the authorities can ask any questions. That can be whoever is the authorized signatory of the company. Mm. But let's say that you, have a company that's owned, the UBO is a UAE um, uh, citizen or a UAE tax resident. So mm -hmm. a non-citizen, but that's based and living in the UAE. Um, and all the entities are in the UAE. There is no parent company or you know ultimate parent company that's outside the UAE. Then the only implication should be the penalty. Then, you know, uh, then there's obviously no exchange of information that will happen with any foreign jurisdiction. Mm. You only have the penalty in that case. Right. Now, on this topic of the UBO, uh, I, I was reading that perhaps ADGM and DIFC have slightly uh, another uh, way of approaching this. Is there a difference between how the, the, the free zones and how the IFC and the ADGM are dealing with the UBOs? Not, not really. I think they have their own rules. There are certain, you know, subtle differences between ADGM's requirements and, and DIFC's, but broadly they do request and ask for details of uh, the UBO. Um, but those were the only two free zones, I think, that were asking for that information. Uh, mm -hmm. In other free zones, you didn't need to give details of the UBO or the details of, um, you know, the the ultimate the parent and the ultimate parent. In all cases, there were there were inconsistencies. Uh, I think there's now a level playing field. Uh, so every UAE entity, other than those in, in the IFC or ADGM, or if it's, a, if it's owned by the, the government of the UAE, mm. only those entities are not required, but now everyone's re required to give similar information. Mm. Uh, maybe, Anilesh, we can stop sharing the screen. We will appear a bit bigger on... Oh, okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Screen. I will do that. Um, yeah. and, it, and it will make yeah. for a, a, a better... Uh, after event video as well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, there's also a good question here. It says, um, could you please provide more information about the registry extract submission by October the 27th? As per the information that they have received, received so far, free zones didn't request any information thus far. 
So free zones have not, I mean, this is now a cabinet uh, decision, um, number, number 58. Uh, there is the, uh, you know, there is the, uh, there's, there's more information that's likely to come in on the, on the format of the, of the filing. Uh, but essentially we know what details need to, need to go in. Um, you know, there's a register of, uh, you know, there's a shareholder register, register of beneficial owners, uh, register of nominee directors uh, needs to be submitted. I think um, it's possible that every free zone may have their own format in which the filing needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and because this um, law is fairly new, I would expect the free zones to, you know, to start reaching out to, to businesses. And if they haven't already, I think it's important for businesses to reach out to free zones mm -hmm. to understand the format of the, of the filing. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of all our Creative Zone clients, I'll encourage you to connect with your with your client relationship manager. Uh, if you need more support and advice on this topic, we can help you and see if we are able to help you. Of course, we are able to help you submit and register these UBOs um, with the authority. Um, let me see what other questions we have here. Excellent presentation, people commenting, thank you so much. Um, excellent presentation, I have received a compliment since then. Okay, I'm gonna read it out. I didn't, I didn't filter this out, but it says, uh, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Nilesh and Lorenzo. I have registered a company as LLC in, in Shams and the activity is international trading. I buy container loads of products from all over Asia, mainly India, and sell to e uh, European Union and USA. Am I su supposed to file for ESR? So, the, so you are an entity. Um, uh, that's, that's there, but I think the key uh, the key factor to determine when the, the company that's purchasing from all over Asia, uh, is it purchasing from related persons or third parties? If it's purchasing from third parties and selling to third parties, then you are outside scope. Mm -hmm. It's only if you're purchasing those containers from parties in Asia, which are related or connected persons as defined under the regulations, only then you are in scope. Good, good, good. Uh, here another question says, does a free zone with unlimited liability of only director is in the definition of licensee? Um, free zone with unlimited liability of directors? Yeah. Well, I think you need to see what's the, if, it's, if, if, if the entity in the free zone is a corporate entity mm -hmm. uh, and corporate entity is a separate legal uh, has separate legal personality, mm -hmm. then it is, and, and if it then does carry on a relevant activity, then uh, it should be in scope. Excellent. Uh, reading out a few more. I saw a few comments, people asking a little bit more of information. How does the, the USR, uh, ESR uh, rules apply for holdings and, and trusts? You brought this up. Is there something else that we can sort of bring up uh, at this stage, Nilesh? So, so, so trusts are outside the scope. If it's a trust, then it's not, uh, even if it carries on um, uh, a relevant activity, it's not a licensee per se, and therefore not in scope. Holding companies are in scope. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have a pure holding company, unless it's a holding company of an investment fund, uh, only then it is exempt. But another ordinary holding company where it's only objective sole objective is holding of equity interests mm -hmm. and it only only earns income by way of dividend and capital gains mm -hmm. then it will be categorized as a holding company but in that if in addition to a holding function if it carries on some other commercial activity mm -hmm. then it will no longer be a holding company you mm -hmm. then need to look at look at what that other commercial activity is and whether that activity on its own becomes a relevant activity or not excellent now with the ESR, there has been some changes to the deadlines. Is there something that we can give some more light on this? They used to be, is it once a year? Now is it every six months that the notifications are meant to be done? So, so for every year, there are two, two compliances that will need to be done. The first is the filing of a notification mm -hmm. that needs to be submitted within six months from the end of the financial year. That's the notification where you'll essentially confirm whether or not you carry on a relevant activity. If so, which activity? 
Do you earn income from that activity? Is that income subject to tax outside? Details of UBO, et cetera, et cetera. That's the notification within six months of the end of the year. And then within 12 months of the end of the year, there will be the more detailed economic substance report mm -hmm. that needs to be filed, where you give more details around the income and expenses from the relevant activity, details around how the substance tests have been met, mm -hmm. uh, details are, and, you know, and other information, financial statements and other information that may be asked by the authorities. We don't have the report format yet. It is expected both notification and report will be filed on the Ministry of Finance portal. It's just that for the first year for FY19, we will have a short period between refiling the notifications on the portal as soon as it goes live in maybe you know November uh, or early December, and then the report going in at the end of December. So the first year there'll be a short period, but after that it should be six months and 12 months from, from 2020 onwards. Excellent, excellent. So for well, the year ended 31st of December 2020, the -hmm. notification needs to be filed by 30th of June 2021, mm -hmm. and the report needs to be filed by the 31st of December 2021. Excellent. Nilesh, we're getting to the end of, of this uh, webinar. It's already 12.08. We usually try to, to stay within the one hour uh, so that we respect uh, what we had agreed in terms of, of the structure of this webinar for today. We really want to thank you to all the attendees. Thank you for connecting. We are going to be sending you the presentation and a small introduction onto the main changes. Please do get in touch with us. All our contact details are there. If you need help and further information on this topic, we're happy to help. Nilesh, thank you so much once again for taking the time. We look forward to keep on cooperating with you and KPMG on many of these initiatives. Thank you, Lorenzo, and thank you, everyone, for your uh, question and, and for your time and patience in, in, in listening through the, through the session. Thank you. Right. And thanks, Creative Zone. As well. Thank you so much, Nines. Thank you, everybody. We'll be in touch until the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.